Praise God. Welcome to One Word Now. And I want to talk to you today. We're going to look at fear just a bit. And um, number one, how to overcome it. Okay? And it's some things that I taught back in 2010. Some quotes and statements that we'll look at. But um, I want to start with this passage. So without wasting any time, let's just dive into it. Turn to Psalms chapter 44. And let's start reading in verse 4. This is a Psalm of David talking about the redemptive power of God. And um, sometimes when we're dealing with fear or intimidation, we don't always see the outcome as clear, crystal clear. Sometimes fear becomes a greater truth to us or a greater presence than even God Himself. And if you're in that quandary right now, I'm here to just simply tell you it can change. It will change. But we have to change first. As Drop just talked about, we have to change, number one, what we speak. Second, what we meditate on. What we give credence to. What we give allegiance to. What we certify or don't certify. And then three, we've got to move to a higher vantage point than the present discomfort. Amen? You have to. If you don't, you will be overcome. You will be overtaken by that that you fear. Job says that this, that that I feared the most has overtaken me. Some want to teach that as God tested him, God tried him, God you know, played like poker with the devil over Job. That is not so. Job opened his mouth and declared some things that allowed the enemy to plunder him. Guard what you say. You know, everybody's like, well, guard what you watch. Guard what you hear. Yeah, but guard what you speak. Because it's not what comes into a man, the Bible says, that defiles him. It's what comes out of the man. Amen? I believe you can have such right stuff inside of you that bad can come in and it gets dissolved in the process. It won't harm you. Right? You hear that teaching about Jesus said you can take up a drink poison or pick up a deadly serpent and it will by no means harm you. What is he saying? You can be so full of truth, so full of destiny, so full of God that even if you ingested something that would harm the normal person, it won't touch you. Amen? So that has many aspects to it. But I want you to see this. You are going to determine your outcome. Not God and not the devil. You will. Now, I know there's a lot of Bible thumpers around the planet that are tuning in and they'll watch this video. So let me just bring this in for you. God has already structured a way of your escape. That is in the New Testament. You can read those verses. There is no temptation which is common to man, which it goes on to say, God has not created a way of escape. Amen? Second, let's jump to the devil. The devil is nothing but a plunderer, a thief, and a liar, and a destroyer. Why do you think he would do anything other than that? Right? So my question is, is if you know he's a plunderer and a destroyer, and you know God has already created a way of escape, you have loss on one side and win on one, on the other. And you're in the middle. You choose. And I'm going to take this theoretical thought and bring it home with this statement. The Scripture also says, Speaking on the behalf of God, a prophet, he said this, I lay before you life and death. Choose life. Therefore, I present to you, you're the one that determines the outcome. You're the one that determines the outcome. Let us not be like Christians of old that sit and wait for God to do something and our, their, heart grows, their heart grows hard because God didn't do in their opinion, because God was waiting for them to get up and pursue. You know, here, uh, here, let me set it up like this too. You remember when the priests had to cross over, was it Jordan? They had to enter the Jordan, and, and they were used to seeing, they saw Moses, knew the story of Moses just lifted up his staff, and the Red Sea parted, right? Now they got to cross Jordan, which is not quite as big as the Red Sea. Would you agree? This is a river. Have you ever seen pictures of Jordan? 
It's not big. Okay? And they've got to cross it. So they probably pulled out their little Moses book, one, two, and three, the self-help guide to splitting water. And they probably tried to do everything like we would, what we had been shown, what we have been exampled or modeled, to get the outcome we desired. But see, sometimes God wants you to trust in faith, listen and obey, right? So the priests are doing what they know to do. But the one thing they failed to do was exhibit faith that steps into the opposition. The water was their opposition. The water held them back from their promise, their desired outcome. What they had to do this time is hear and trust God and move. When they stepped into the water, it says, then it parted. They had to get into the water. You know, I don't know about you. I kind of like it when I can stand on the edge of the mountain and just lift up a staff and it parts. <laughs> right? That's kind of cool. Right? You go to the bank. There's nothing in the bank account. And all of a sudden, it just a check from nowhere shows up. Right? And you walk in there with your big faith muscles. That's cool. That's nice. But you know what? There may be a time to where you just have to step into the opposition. Step into the discomfort. Step into the dysfunction. And then God parts it. What am I saying? I want you to have the type of faith that literally can endure all, can withstand all, and can conquer all. Amen? Now don't ask me to repeat that. I can't. <laughs> but with that being said, let's go to this. Psalms 44. And this isn't in the pre prepared message I got this morning, but this is something from praise and worship. Look at verse 4, Psalms 44, verse 4. David says, you are my king, O God. Command victories for Jacob. Through, uh, uh, through you, we will push down our enemies. Through your name, we will trample those who rise against us. Look at this. For I will not trust in my bow, nor shall I, my sword save me. But you have saved us from our enemies and have put to shame those who hated us. Can I tell you something right now? If you're a God-fearing, Bible-believing Christian in this nation, there are those people that do hate you. There are those that want this country to become extremely liberal and non-God based. There are political agendas that do want to do away with the Bible and our freedom of worship. But I've got good news today. They will never win. And we don't have to take up arms against them because we have a great defender on our behalf. As we're faithful to Him, He's faithful to us. Does that make sense? And I don't believe God would give us this great country for a bunch of non-believing God-type people to overtake it. I don't. I believe that's an oxymoron. Look at verse 7. But you have saved us from our enemies and have put to shame those who hated us. In God we boast all day long and praise your name forever. Amen? And I'm going to encourage you, you need to create some Selah moments. That word Selah right there means that's just the way it is. So be it. Amen. It's the, it's the period and the exclamation point at the end of a statement. Amen? And God's going to give you some Selah moments if you trust in Him. God's going to teach you some great things and how to maneuver ahead of your enemy if you listen to Him. See, it's one thing to hear. It's another thing to listen. The Bible says, He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit of God is saying to the church, right? You know that passage in Revelations. I may not quote it just so precise, but you know which one I'm talking about. And it's calling account of people that are believers. Church people. And it says it's one thing, it's making a statement, but it's calling them to an accountability of really hearing and really listening. 
See, how do you know when you really listened? It's because your heart is to implement that information received. Not everybody that's got an ear is receptive. For you to move in another dimension of knowledge, understanding, or intelligence, wisdom, you have to receive it first. And receiving means I'm putting it into practice. I'm intently focused so that I can find something I can launch forward with. Does that make sense? Have you ever sit in a business meeting and, and, and through the humdrum of all the things covered, all of a sudden there's this like something just jumped out and you went, that's why I'm sitting here. I've listened to two hours of this just for that one nugget, right? Or sometimes you're in a business meeting and you're in decision-making mode and you're one of the persons that makes the decisions or a group of them. And you have to intently listen to all the troubles or the problems so that you're not being consumed by the problem. Too many people are consumed by the problem. you got to become a solutions person because solutions people are paid greatly. Solutions-minded people will accelerate and succeed in every economy. If you're a solution man or woman, guess what? There's always a place for you at the biggest and broadest tables in this nation. Do you hear me right now? So become solutions-minded. And I'm telling you, your gift will make more room for you than you can ever imagine. Amen? Back in September the 25th, 2010, I stated the following regarding our nation's condition. Christians across our nation were giving themselves to uncertainty and fear. We had a president that, that was purporting several types of things and making room for other religions other than Christianity. Usually Christianity was the religion getting the blunt end of the stick. And certainly not their concerns were not be taken care of or upheld. Do you hear me? The conservative mindset, the conservative man or woman, your ideology was being thrown out as if it was invalid, unvalid, not being validated from the White House. And it was as if it was insignificant and it was old-fashioned and it needed to be uh, ideology that was killed. Bottom line, if you were a conservative, you didn't have a voice, you were coached, told that you needed to accept everybody else's opinion at the expense of your own. So when you voiced your opinion, and it being straightforward and challenging people in their lifestyle, you were told to be the one to be shut up and to be silenced. Don't speak. Because when you speak, you're disrespecting others. Even the other person could speak everything demoralizing your theology, and they were promoted. That was the state of our country. We got a glimpse into a future nation whenever they turn away from God what it could look like and what it could become in the matter of eight years. What our forefathers for 200 plus years fought for, stood for, gave their lives for, in eight years was demoralized and demolished to rubble. Do you hear me? Let us learn from that lesson well. So that when we move into our future, we are bolder, stronger, and more accurate than we've ever been. Amen? Amen? Amen. And there are people that had the power and the authority and the platforms to bring change were silenced and living in caves. This was the state of our country. People in Christendom were changing their theology to accommodate the opposition. They didn't want to be a target. They wanted to be accepted. Let me explain something. If you stand for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, you're always a target for the word's sake. If you stand for righteousness and dignity and purity, you're always a target. If you stand for law-abiding, you're always a target of lawlessness and lasciviousness. If you stand for purity, sexual purity, you're always going to be un, uh, an ideology that wants to be diminished by a liberal agenda. It's just the way it is. It's just the way it is. I lost friends because of what we stand for over the last 10, 15 years. 10 years. 
I mean, you were narrow five years. Because I refuse to say that that humanist sec, uh, secular opinion is a greater truth than the Bible. Refused it. And I will not turn away from that. The only thing we have in Christendom is God's Word to stand on. You take that away, you diminish that, you've got nothing. In the last few weeks, a major denomination in Christendom in this country has thrown the Bible to the side and promoting another one. I won't even say what it is on there. Hear me right now. To where they're not praying to God, Jehovah now. They're praying to a prophet. You fill in the blank. Same denomination has said that the, the tenets and articles of solid foundation doctrinal truths of what is acceptable for leadership, 20, uh, 18 years ago, they, they threw that one out. Where it says, husband of one wife. And I think they have it like husband of one husband. Do you hear me? And they have openly promoted homosexuality amongst leadership and senior leader, as well as lesbianism. You tell me. I'll probably get hate mail for this. But it's still truth. What truth are we going to believe? One that man massages to accommodate his dysfunction? Or a truth that's a plumb line that says this is right and that's wrong. This is black and that's white. This is sin and that's righteousness. Which one's going to regulate your life? I know what we're going to use to regulate this church. Right? Yeah. So with this, this was the state of the country. Media outlets constantly reporting terrorist attacks while our government appeared to do nothing. Well, our government appeared to take a back seat and even help open up doors so more attacks could take place, more Americans killed abroad. Do you hear me? In one argument, they're fighting against guns while they're peddling guns under the table south of the border. That was the state of our headship. Amen? Let me give you insight. A mule will never be a horse. It looks like one at a distance, but the closer you get, it's still a jackass. I, I'm going to preach it in here today. Does that make sense? It still is. Now, they have a different stride. You can use them for certain things, but it's not a horse. You take, you take a, a mule to, to an equestrian outing, they're going to think, you're a ma kettle. What the heck showed up, Right? Come on now. Come on now. You know, the Wright brothers, God bless them for their invention, set an entire industry in transportation, I mean stratosphere. But they would look awfully strange showing up in this new, what is it, Red Bull airplane races that they're having all over the world trying to compete, would they not? That's about the difference between a horse and a mule. But when you have headship that has a hidden agenda that is anti-God, anti-Christ, anti-faith in this nation, it will never stand as long as believers like you and I keep believing, keep declaring, and keep praying. God will not have it. It's just the way it is. Media outlets, if you listen to them, some people allowed them to change their internal belief system and they started declaring that America was coming to an end that God was judging America and this was our fault because we stood for righteousness and we just didn't let anything go do you hear me that's what that's what's being purported or was moving on look at this they were talking of a failing economy and that would to even make matters worse but we all took a different opinion you remember this we said, no, we're not going to believe for a failing economy. We're not going to believe, even if numbers are looking us in the face, we're not going to believe that. We're believing something greater. Amen. Amen? Even if ungodliness, unrighteousness is being promoted under this administration, we're not going to believe that. We're believing for something greater. 
And to the more they want us to become real liberalized, we're going to become more conservatized, which is we're going to get stronger on the truth and keep ourselves and walk in according to truth, the word, more pure. And many didn't like that. I can tell you that right now. You know, some were raising loosey goosey, and we're raising, you know, virgins. Big difference. You know, Madonna can sing like a virgin because she's not one. Hello? She lost that so long ago, she probably can't remember. Do you hear me? And if we're looking to a specimen like that to lead us, we will always be in a ditch or a jail cell. Come on now. I can't believe the women that are in that sector haven't found a better spokesperson. I mean, that's going deep into the barrel. Hello? Anyways, moving on. Look at this. Let me get off my soapbox. But this was the state of what we were all looking at. And you and I, together, we said, no, we're going to keep praying the word. We're going to keep saying God's going to bless this nation. We're going to keep prophesying the blessings coming and change is coming. And I believe we're experiencing that now. Amen? We took a different stand. Watch. We took a different view that says the Bible is based in believing God and it still is in charge and has control. Giving up is never an option for a believer. And that was our mind, mindset and mentality. I want you to understand something. Do, do not develop a faith that has to receive accolades. Develop a faith that can procure God's promise. Does that make sense? I, I've said this for over a year now. It's kind of a little catchy phrase. I always talk to drop and when we're having conversations, I say, you know what? The problem with that person is they believe their own headlines. They believe their own head lines. Think about that. You and I cannot afford to believe our own headlines as good as they may be. We can't because we'll end up deceiving ourselves. Pride will set in and we'll set up for our destruction. Never believe your own headlines. Celebrities are great at that. And that's why celebrities are here today and old news tomorrow. Amen? Here's some of the three statements that we were talking about back then. Number one, we kept saying this, what is right in a nation will only temporarily be hidden by what is wrong in a nation. Temporarily hidden. Next one we said is fear of the future is trying to undermine our faith in our God to provide and to prosper His people. People were uncertain as Christians about what the future would hold for them. Therefore, they allowed that to undermine their faith in God. And God was the component that would bring them out and could bring them out. It was what our forefathers faced when they were in Egypt. There were those that believed. But there were also a group that didn't believe even on the exit. Even when they were pursuing you know, the promised land. They were only trekking for 40 years, but they'd been living under tyranny for 450. They had only given about a 10% of uh, time as to those that held the promise. What am I saying? 90% of the people will let go. Only 10% will hang on. In any business, if you were to evaluate it, you'll find that less than 10% do all the work. It's how business is. <clears throat> it's just how it is. Second, in any ministry, same thing. The, the thing about our ministry is that we all get involved. <laughs> we have to, right? Have to be engaged. But I'm here to think, ask you a question. How many people have you seen come through those doors? Has the teaching changed? Has the Spirit of God changed? Has the engagement with God changed? No. No. For whatever reason. And I can tell you this, Darren and Drop won't change because we've been preaching the same message since the early 90s. We just have to update it because technology keeps, you know, we used to talk about a brick phone. Now we have to talk about, you know, the Android and the iPhone. All right? An iPad didn't exist back then. It's called a notepad, <laughs> right? So that had to evolve. But watch this. The next thing we said is our faith must be word-based, Christ-centered, God-instated. 
Therefore, we shall not fear. No matter what was going on, we never allowed fear into our home, just like many of you. We would not tolerate it, would not allow it. I certainly couldn't lead this ministry being fear-based. Do you hear me? Couldn't. We never will. Because faith does not remove a mountain, it builds a mountain. Fear builds mountains. Faith removes them. Does that make sense? Now, with that being said, look at Isaiah 54, 14. It says, In righteousness you shall be established. You shall be far from oppression. Notice it says far. F-A-R. Far. That doesn't mean in close proximity. That means you moved away from. That means your lifestyle and core belief system has moved you away from the territory of oppression. Now this I present to you is a decision. Because you have plenty of reasons to be depressed. We could all sit, you know, if we weren't faith-based people, we could all sit around, have a cup of coffee, and probably within 30 minutes be so depressed we would need Prozac or whatever. We probably could. Because let me tell you something. People that are moving forward deal with problems. People that move forward deal with challenges. Why? Your solutions, people. So it's ever-present, but you don't live next to it. Does that make sense? No, you can't. So it says here, <clears throat> Isaiah, we are far from oppression. Far from oppression. I have literally met with people uh, from, from the church over the last 15, 17 years, and also that, that are not a part of this church, that are bound by oppression. And, and I'm going to use an example of one that, that never attended this church. That's safe, right? I remember sitting with this lady, and she would reload quicker. And I think I can think pretty fast. I usually think about a paragraph ahead. She would reload faster than I could tie down the last argument or important part of her argument. And when I say argument, I don't mean fighting. I mean as in debate, arguing. You know, where, where there's an opinion and you're trying to bring a truth to it. That, that, that is called argument from a legal standpoint, I guess. But to, to try to help her. And it wasn't to joust. It wasn't to play tug of war. It was to help move her forward in her life. To move away from pain and shame. To move her away from discomfort. So she could experience some peace in her life. Right? And I'm telling you, the lady would reload faster than I could load. You know, uh, you, I, I'm telling you, I couldn't hit her target with the 17 round clip. Probably need more like a 400,000 round clip. Because when I would say, okay, this is no longer present in your life, this right here, this issue is moved out. You know, you divorced it three marriages ago, it's gone. Hello? Why are you still in fear over that? She was reloading, reloading, reloading. And here's the tragedy. It's because of her problems that she fed daily instead of her solution. Does that make sense? Now, I don't believe we need to be insensitive. I do believe we need to be thought-provoking and caring of people. And they do or have times in their life dealt with some serious pain. But that pain can only continue when you give it authority to or credence to. When you promote that on a daily basis into your life and thought processes, you are giving it power to conquer you. You're giving it power to conquer you. And there has to be a point in time in development to where we say, you know what? The purporter of that pain is not present. Therefore, I don't need to be in danger any longer. Does that make sense? So far from oppression. For you shall not fear. Look at the words the prophet Isaiah is saying. You shall not fear, and from terror, for it shall not come near you. It's an immense promise. If you deal with fear, 
if you deal with anxieties, this is a great verse for you. Because it handles all of them in one passage. It's far from you. So you don't have to even live in terror. We don't live in terror. My kids live abroad. We refuse as a family to live in terror. Do you hear me? We believe greater. No weapon formed against the Goodmans will prosper. Amen? None. None. Now, I'm not stupid with that and go out and jump in front of tanks or whatever, you know, or the FedEx truck. No weapon. <laughs> Probably better than that. The guy that brings Bill around. <laughs> the mailman. <laughs> no weapon. I don't jump out in front of the little postal Jeep. No way. But let me tell you something. We have a faith like you that whenever the situation would evolve or occur, we know no weapon of the enemy will prosper in its advance against us. Does that make sense? Look at this. So, a couple of questions. What are you and I, what are we established in? I think that's the, a fair question. What are we established in? Or what do we allow to be established in our hearts or thoughts? Because whatever we allow to be established in our thought process or in our heart will take up residence and it begins to form uh, a fortress within our heart. A fortified area. Now we can also call that a stronghold, could we not? And a stronghold, many times as soon as I say stronghold, we that are church, we think we need to cast the devil out. I think we need to cast the thought out. If I can cast out enough thoughts, I believe the devil is probably sitting over there just drinking a latte. Because sometimes I don't even think he's present, but he left a thumbprint. And you believe the thumbprint greater than him, you know, than truth in, in front of you. Now, I also understand there are times it is spiritual. But we Christians go spiritual too fast. We pull out the spiritual gun way too quick when most of these things could be handled with the natural gun. As a man thinks in his heart, he is. The verse doesn't say, as a demon made you think. It says, as a man, person, individual, thinks in his heart, he is, he becomes. What is it saying? As he's established up a process of thought, he fortified in his heart a dysfunction, and now he's living that dysfunction. That's what it's saying. Amen? I don't know about you. The easiest thing for me to stop doing was Chewing tobacco. Many of you are like, oh my God, that's disgusting. Yeah, it is disgusting. But think about it. I had plenty of friends that still probably to this day are chewing tobacco. Some of them have lost jawbone, front teeth. Some of them have cancer in their mouth. But they haven't stopped Chewing, why? Because they fortified that in their heart as a habit and habitual activity becomes the stronghold. That's tobacco. Watch. Drinking, same thing. I remember, you know what? I remember the last time I got drunk. I do. And I don't know about you, but I didn't you know, drink just to kind of get drunk. I drank to get blasted. Hey, it happened to be free pink tequila. I'd never seen pink tequila. So I thought I might as well just have enough of it. I could swim out. That's my wife about. We were on a cruise, man. This is in the, in the early 90s. Every time they volunteer, needed a volunteer on the cruise ship, I, was, I volunteered. I'm like, hey, it's free. I'm in. Right? I mean, what are they going to do? Throw me off the boat and leave me out here? Not going to happen. So I pogoed. I did the lim limbo. Limbo. Did the limbo. Yep, did that one. Then, then it wasn't fun enough just to bend down. I started doing Pete Rose, you know, like he used to slide into second base head first. So, so I asked him, forget that. I'm going to do it my own way. So I went trekking across the boat deck and slid underneath the thing. Of course, it got a good, good you know, reception from the crowd. All they had to do is give me more pink te tequila. I mean, I was ready to drive the ship if I needed. Trust me. I had fun when I got drunk. I don't understand drunks that cry. I'm like, heck no, I'm going to have fun. I get an excuse to act stupid. Amen? <laughs> Come on now. But I remember it. I'll never forget, I got off the boat, 
A lady came running over to my wife. She's trying to hold me up. Obviously, she's small, you know. And, and this, I'm green, literally. And the lady sets me down and goes, runs into a restaurant and starts bringing out bags of ice and putting on me. So I was intoxicated way too much. And I was seasick way too much. And I guess I was green as seaweed. Yeah, so my wife just set me there. I cooled down. She got us a cab, took me to the hotel, and put Darren to sleep for the rest of the day. <laughs> True story. Last time I was intoxicated. I'll never forget. The next day I woke up and I looked at her and went, you saw me drunk for the last time. Hope so. No, it's done. Never have since. What am I saying? You can break down walls that you fortified, but it takes work and commitment. Does that make sense? And that works from gossip to drinking to illicit sex to smoking to what else? Thievery. Uh, what else can we come up with? Any other type of sin that tries to destroy a person's life. Does that make sense? Now, what about this one? Here's a sin. Living in fear and speaking a lie. Well, we're going under. You're not going under. God's Word says you're going over. That's a lie. That's actually speaking a curse because it's contrary to God's promise. Right? How do you break down that fortified area? Speak something different. Speak the truth to it. Right? Amen? So, so with this, I understand it is uncomfortable to change. It's uncomfortable to challenge something that you fortified in your life or lifestyle. But the only person that can destroy the activity of it is you and I. Amen? Does that make sense? Let's move this down the road a little bit. Watch this. So now, if you establish it in your heart, in your thoughts, it starts to be established. You gave it credence. You gave it a law to exist. Does that make sense? Watch. Who is residence in your heart? Who has taken up residence there? Have you ever asked that question? Who has residence? Well, let me help you with the answer. It can only be God, you, or the devil. How about that? Those are the three choices. Now, it's not so wrong. I, okay, let's talk Christians. The devil, we moved out. Sometimes we move him out of our life, but we don't move out his thought processes or his opinions. That's when we've got to renew our mind according to God's Word. Right? God wants you to be the master of your heart, and He wants Him to have the residence, the property, the title deed. And I believe as a Christian, that's what you've certified or given your life to. Right? Does that make sense? Right? So then it should be very, very factual that as a man and woman that have set residence in their heart for God, and that the master of that domain thinks within their heart they become. You should take on more attributes of God, what God represents, than former lifestyle, formal way of being, formal domain of Satan. You should have no attributes of Satan in your life. Imagine that. Imagine that. And I believe that's what we're all growing to become. I really do. I believe we made the decision. We've, we received Jesus Christ. We are in the beloved. We are connected to God. That is sealed. Our spirit's sealed in Him. I got all that and I believe all that. What we've got to do is pluck out the leftover weeds called our thoughts and get rid of those. Amen? And they're just leftover weeds. They're not oak trees. Sometimes <laughs> I've had all types of Christians come through my life and some of them make an oak tree out of nothing more than some Johnson grass. And it's like, my goodness. And they try to conform me to their way of thought and I just go, sorry. Been there, done that, and this is much better. Amen? And I know you're that way too. What about this? Look at this one. What spirit tries to direct your heart or its emotions? What spirit tries to? And when you can determine that and rightfully appraise that, you can say, sorry, not doing that anymore. 
Sorry, not going down that path anymore. Sorry, not allowing my emotions to go that way and get ramped up anymore. Amen? Just not doing it. And I believe that's the sign of maturity for a believer. Amen? Too many relationships have imploded because of emotion. Too many um, business ventures have, have blown up because of people's emotions. Because here's what happens. The emotion is the bomb, right? Then watch. Character is the aftermath. So emotion can be very powerful. So you have this emotion. Let's say uh, anger, right? Powerful emotion. It's already happened. It exploded. Boom. You see the mushroom of the explosion in the air. But you follow it up with an attitude that has to certify that happening. So now you start trying to take out the person in the cubicle next to you. <laughs> I mean, have you ever seen this? Um, or or you, start, you start an onslaught against the owner of the company. Or you start an onslaught against the product or service they offer. Whoops. Does that make sense? I know, well, the, if not people here, most of you guys are business owners, but people tuning in around the world. I've seen this. I've seen employees that basically hate being on, on the job site simply because they're not the ones that own it. And I always said, well, why don't you start your own then? Why don't you go across the street and start your own business? You know, if it's so bad here, why don't you find another location? Sometimes they were such nasty employees, we wanted to help them find another location. All right? It's pretty bad when you find a headhunter for them. <laughs> Please find them another job. We will pay you to get rid of them. No. But what am I saying? Emotions can push a person to activity in their life that they never thought would be possible. And when you own your emotions, when you own them, you'll put them in their proper place and not be led by them. Does that make sense? When they own you, you're at their beck and call. Put this in your notes, please. Whoever owns the space in your heart determines your direction. Whoever owns the space in your heart determines your direction. This is why I say it needs to be you and God. Because the two of you together will determine a great direction for your life to go in. Now, it's going to take some planning. It's going to take some growth. It's going to take some maturing in areas. It's going to take sometimes walking out on water. I've never met a business owner that started out and that wasn't afraid of, of what, the, you know, what they were getting ready to, to jump into. A little bit of apprehension. Let me put it that way. That's probably more accurate. But I'm here to also tell you, there's something in you that has an innate ability to believe and to keep pressing forward, even when you don't have the budget, even when cash flow is waning, even when costs of goods and services are going up, you keep finding a solution. Amen? And that's why you'll be here tomorrow. And that's why you have confidence the enemy is not taking you out today. Not going to happen. I must be a popular preacher. Even the cockroaches are coming to listen to me. Amen? Praise God. One thing about own church, we have big cockroaches. We don't have these little mamby-pamby ones. We have faith cockroaches. They come in and the ground shakes when they walk. I mean, they have big mothers. Amen? <laughs> Praise the Lord. I can just imagine what people think overseas. They have what? Yes, they're dinosaur level size. Amen? <laughs> Put this in your notes, please. Look at this. Truth is more powerful, thought-provoking, and impactful than a lie. Truth is. But for too long, we've taken the lie and we've inflated the lie to where it's more impactful in our life. It isn't. The truth is more impactful. Now, the truth takes a little longer to go around the world than a lie. The lie, the lie travels at rapid speed. You know, the rabbit... He he's, uh, takes off like he's going to win the race. But the tortoise always finishes. Never forget that. Sometimes, Drop and I, we eat breakfast every morning together. We make smoothies together. 
we got this routine. You hear me say, I don't do dishes. I've been lying. She's got me doing dishes now, and I actually am enjoying it as we get to talk. I do dishes with my wife every morning now. Isn't that fun? Watch. But we often talk about, you know, everybody wants to take off fast, hit a, hit a pace, and keep going. MLM companies, I mean, they're no, notorious for this. But here's what we've been saying for the last six months. Even the tortoise finishes. Even the tortoise finishes. We tell our kids that when they're talking and reeling and you know they got hustle and bustle in their life and lifestyle, we say, even the tortoise finishes. Do you hear me? Because let me tell you something. Faith is always working, even when it seems as if it's moving slow. Amen? It's going towards the promise. Moving on. Live for God and give all yourself to Christ. Then your future will be fabulous. Then your future will be fabulous. I am more optimistic now than I have been in so many years about what's going to happen in this country. The possibilities. The potential. And it's not just based on the party, you know, the Republicans being in, in the White House. No. I just believe there was some important things stated from a person in the power position that set this emotion in play over this nation. The Bible's real clear. When righteous men lead, people rejoice. Real clear about it. I'm rejoicing. I don't know about the rest of these people out here burning stuff down. I'm rejoicing. Amen? It's like, I don't know what they're all mad about. Like, you know, just pipe down and go have a coffee. It's going to be better. Now, here's what we need to do. Is every one of those that are in opposition to good changes come into our country, we need to probably write their name down so when the good changes arrive, they don't get to partake in it. What would happen then? That would be a hard lesson to learn, wouldn't it? Wow. Anyways, moving on. Isaiah 60, 17. Look at what this passage says. Instead of bronze, I will bring gold. Instead of iron, I will bring silver. Instead of wood, bronze. And instead of stones, iron. I will also make your officers peace and your magistrates righteousness. When you read this, it almost sounds like a riddle. But let me break it down like this for us today. But it promises greatest value and worth. It's an exchange. And I believe what the exchange is, God is being unconventional in His way of thought here compared to man. We often think in the world it has to come a certain way. Right? You have to work up the ladder. It has to come this way. It has to be, I start here and I end up there. But according to God, He takes bronze and He brings gold. You give God bronze, He gives you gold. I may not be the sharpest tool in the shed. That's a great business deal right there. Right? Think about this. The next one, He says, instead of iron, I give you silver. Give Him your iron, He gives you silver. That ain't bad. You can't, you can't build the internal structure with silver. It takes iron. But let me tell you something. If you got enough silver, you can buy all the iron you need, honey. Right? Look at how unconventional thought. Instead of wood, look, this one always threw me. Instead of wood, bronze. So I'm like, God, you took bronze from us. Now why are you giving us bronze back? I bet you wondered that, huh? Look at it. It's a riddle. Let me tell you why. Because when you're in business with God, when you're involved with God, when you're in covenant relation with God, it's perpetuated. It starts all over again. Your bronze, wood you exchange, He gives you bronze. You take your bronze, you give it back to Him, and He gives you gold. You have iron, and you take and exchange it silver. And the whole thing is perpetuated all over again. This is why I say your future is fabulous in God. You can never outgive God. You can never run faster than God. You can never outplan God because God has great plans for you. Amen? It doesn't matter what economic structure. It doesn't matter what governmental structure. I'm telling you, even in communist Russia, I know of Christians that are prospering very well. Even in the Middle East, under the tyranny of what goes on there, I know Christians that are there, and they are prospering. You hear me? Now, that's not the preferred systems to be under, obviously. But let me tell you something. With God, 
All things are possible if you're in covenant with Him. Does that make sense? Amen? Watch, it goes on to say, and I'll make your officers peace and your magistrates righteousness. Look at that. God's going to put leadership and headship on you, whether it be an enterprise, business, and ministry, or in this world. They will be peace regulated and righteous people. Isn't that amazing? It's amazing. When you get engaged with someone, this is what you should expect peace and righteousness. When you look at doing a business deal with somebody, this is what you should look for and expect. Peace and righteousness. If you don't have peace, don't do it. If you can't walk and operate in righteousness in it, don't do it. And certainly you can demand that from your partner. Watch. The world's best that it can offer you and I is bronze in this passage. It's the best that the other side of God could offer. It was the best. Bronze. And God's best was gold. Isn't that amazing? God's path offers more precious raw materials for you to work with than what you can have in the world. Imagine that. I'm telling you, if you're walking with God as a business person, get ready. Your bank account's going to be full. Your home will be full of peace and joy. He'll give you so many ideas in, in this uh, global economy of how to increase your natural wealth and to help others in the path and along the way. He will. He will. I love this. I often say this. Think beyond the borders of Clovis and Fresno. Hello? Some people that live in this region think this is the entire world. Like, are you kidding me? It's like they need a passport to leave town. Like, no. You're only in Fresno County. You know? Well, I was thinking about going to Madera. I wonder if I should take a passport. Like, this is the total sum total of our country right here, Clovis Fresno. Like, dear Jesus. I've actually met people, and my kids have. They're like, Dad, can you believe it? They're telling us, I've never left Clovis. I'm like, how? Are you kidding me? True story. Met kids from Clovis. They had never left Clovis. I'm like, how? If I were you... I would take 99 bucks, hop Amtrak, and go see some countryside. True story. One, one family said, yeah, we've never left California. I'm like, why? Well, just had no need to. I'm like, find one. It's just amazing. But this is also why we can say some people are very narrow with their opinion and their insight. is because they haven't looked beyond the borders. Do you hear me? Can you imagine living in East Germany when the wall was up? You could only look as far as you could get up in a high place and peer over the wall. Your whole world stopped at that cement wall, brick wall, and barbed wire fence. It stopped right there. Because you knew people that ran into the gap and got shot. They didn't make the wall. Your whole world stopped at the edge of that wall. Can you imagine living there and looking over the wall from a high vantage point and look over the wall and see the western side of Germany? They're driving newer cars, living in nicer homes, wearing newer clothes, and you're stuck with wearing gray. The color of communist. Back then it was. Gray, black, drop colors. Can you imagine? What about China? Whenever China was closed up, the best you could ever have is flannel gray. Imagine that. But let me tell you something. There's some people that when they see the wall, one question is, how are we getting over it? That's how they're ruled by. How are we going through it? How are we going over it? Do you see? Because the wall will not limit them from God's best in their life. Amen. I have a dear friend that's a preacher, a minister in what was former East Germany. Drinking whiskey, smoking a stogie from some Bibles that he confiscated out of a car trunk. Freezing his, 
his buns off at a checkpoint. Decided just to open up the box and read whatever was in there. He knew his Bibles. Bored stiff, starts reading the Bible. And he says, I sat there and I got saved. That's the power of what's on your lap and in your phone. That's the power of God's Word. It will reach us wherever we're at, and it will keep us. Amen? He started an underground church. It's no longer underground. As soon as the wall fell, it became very loud and worth a lot. Did you hear me? Look at this. Verse 18. Violence shall no longer be heard in your land. Now your land is your property. You should not allow the words of violence on your property. Whether you're renting or owning, it's your domain. In your domain, violence should not be tolerated. Do you hear me? Or violent speech. And violent speech isn't, you know, you arguing with somebody. Violent speech is when you start speaking contrary to what God says your family can have. That's violent speech. Amen? When you start siding with the devil, that's violent speech. Does that make sense to us? Amen. Look, and it goes on to say, neither wasting nor destruction within your borders. Hey, God's all about walls. So am I. I jokingly said the other day <laughs> to a person, I almost meant it though. Man, if we build that wall, I'm just going to take some of the guys from the church if they want to go and I'll go lay some brick. Yeah. Walls are good. Walls can permit things to come in and they can keep things out. They're not all bad. Do you hear me? A wall can be a good thing. I'm glad heaven has a wall. And its pearl gate is big. And if you are in right standing with God, it permits you to come in wide open door. Do you hear me? Wouldn't that be a great missions trip? What are we here for? We're just here to lay some brick. I'm going to write John 3.16 on some of those bricks. No. I said that to the person. They about spit their food out. <laughs> It's like, my goodness, I've snuck behind walls to preach the gospel. Do you hear me? Let me tell you something. God has bordered up and walled up some areas of your life which is keeping destruction out from wasting you. Does that make sense? It goes on to say, but you shall, be, you shall call your walls salvation and gates of praise. Why don't we start praying for our president like that? Well, President Trump's going to be building some walls of salvation and some gates of praise. Let me tell you something. When you come in here and you get to be a part of the American lifestyle, you ought to praise all the way across the border. I've been in Tijuana. Trust me. It's not beachfront property. Amen. It's shanty level. Do you hear me? Wouldn't that be funny if President Trump did that? Just put salvation in the bricks? And a big gate of praise. You know, he hangs out with Paula White. That's possible. It's possible. <laughs> Put these two things in your notes. Two great defenses. We're almost done. Our lives being walled by Christ's salvation. Two great defenses. This will keep you, no matter what comes against you, what I'm sharing with you right here. Walled by Christ's salvation. And I say Christ's salvation because... We need to understand there is purported salvations from other religions. There's purported forms of salvations in the thoughts of man. But Christ's salvation is an eternal salvation, an eternal reward, and it certifies you'll spend eternity in God's abode. Amen? That's why I say Christ's salvation. Next, here's the next one. We enter and leave through the gate of praise. We enter and leave through the gates of praise according to this verse. So when you walk into your home, it's praise. When you leave your home, it's praise. And when we get more focused on praising what God's already done for us, we can be assured our future is fabulous and bright. I don't know about you, but if he's a dad like this dad, when my kids praise me, I'm looking for a credit card, a bank account, or a check to write. Amen? Come on. How many dads know when your daughter starts praising you, you're ready to take her to town, buy that girl a pantsuit or an outfit, right? Caleb figured this out, so when we'd go around a car lot, he'd start praising me real big. I'm like, I know what you're up to. Yeah. 
But we know this about Father God. If you ask of bread, He will not give you a stone. We know that passage, don't we? What we ask, He provides. He will give to us. Right? And so, your gates need to be the gates of praise. Praise during challenging times is like a hurricane hitting the enemy's camp. One time, Drop and I were getting pummeled, and I mean on every side. On every side. And the Christians that were around us at the time, they, you know, I know they were God people, but they couldn't discern to save their life. We'd be at home with an empty refrigerator. We'd given all to the work of the ministry, given all to missionaries, and we'd depleted ourselves. And I mean, I'm sitting here believing for gas money to drive five blocks to go to the church to be a pastor. They all assumed just because we lived in a nice house that we had hordes of cash and my angels were going out gleaning gold from around the four corners of the planet and bringing it to our house. I one time in my haste and upset, I looked at her and I go, my God, can't these people that we teach how to pray in tongues even hear that we need milk? Hello? She's like, would you stop it? You're getting all worked up. I'm like, no, I, I was on a tangent, man. Thank God I only do that behind closed doors, you guys. Anyways, so I go down to the church and I'm believing God to get there. Seriously. I get to the church and the least likely person that would ever attend our church, I mean the most rambunctious, rebellious person, walks in the door and says, Pastor, God told me to come and give this to you. Handed me like 10 or $12. It dropped me right in the floor. She's standing there looking at me like, what's wrong with him? I'm wailing, moaning, and repenting. <laughs> Serious. True story. I took her into my office. I said, you have no idea what you just did. You, you, that voice you heard that said, go and do this, that is absolutely God's voice. Now, use that voice and follow it the rest of your life and you're going to be fine, girl. <laughs> True story. If I told you her lifestyle, you'd be more amazed. And we were trying to disciple her and bring her out of some darkness. Trust me. And I explained the situation. And she's like, oh, pastor, I had no idea. But God said, do this and this. And I just came by the church because I'm like, because of you, I get to go get some milk. You know, I was that level of crying. I'm going to get gas to drive home. You know, yeah, I know what that's like. I do. And I know what God off, often, often does. He comes through when you least expect it. Amen? And that's what makes Him so unique. But during that whole time, we had to learn praise even in the difficult times because it's a hurricane hitting the enemy's camp. Amen? Praise always gets the attention of heaven. Put that in your notes. Eleanor Roosevelt said this, the future belongs to those who believe in the beauty of their dreams. Not just in the dream, but the beauty of the dream. The beauty of the dream. The future belongs to those who believe in the beauty of their dreams. Amen? Look at what Winston Churchill said. The price of greatness is responsibility. The price of greatness is responsibility. Put this in your notes. Many seek advice. Only the wise receive it and profit. Only the wise receive it and profit. Proverbs 1.5. Look at this. A wise man will hear and increase in learning. See, the difference is the wise man hears with the intention of receiving. To be added to. You know, have you ever been in the presence of somebody, you, you, they ask you your opinion and you start giving it and it's absolutely spot on, it fits, and they're rejecting it as soon as it leaves your mouth. You ever had that happen to you? It's like, if you didn't want this as the answer, why don't you just say so? Why don't you just say, just lie to me? Just, just tell me a lie, okay? 
But imagine this, the wise person, there's something about a wise person, their heart becomes an open ear. It ready, it's ready to receive. It becomes a reciprocal, if you will. It, it receives that data, that info in. And as soon as it hits the heart, it starts working and finding resolve and solution. Does that make sense? Now, not everybody has an ear to hear. They don't. But you, I believe, have a beacon for truth. You have a beacon that's receptive and it's wanting wise counsel and is ready to utilize it for your well-being. Does that make sense? And if you stay in that frame of mind, there is no limit to what God can do with you and for you. As wise men will hear an increase in learning and a man of understanding will acquire, look at that, acquire wise counsel. To acquire something, you got to go after it. You got to pursue it. You've got to pursue it. It's like it's not always just going to drop out of the heavens. I'm, I'm sure for you guys to get where you're at, you had to pursue knowledge you did not have. You had to think in a realm your brain never went to before or a theater of thought for you to get the results you're getting month after month after month. That metamorphosis took place not because you were sitting on your rusty dusty with, with you know, wax in your ears and, and cotton balls. It was because you guys were intently trying to hear for the next chain of events, next sequel of your life so that you could make it greater. Right? You guys tried some things. Hey, you've got to try some stuff to see what works and what doesn't work. There's never a failure. It's just a learning lab. Amen? And when you find your stride, you just, you just throttle it. And that's how increase comes. I can tell you right now, our practice would not be where it's at, and we're not, we would not be working the way we do with clients today if we held on to the technology or the revelation or the insight or the expertise we had in the late 80s and early 90s. Our entire industry moved beyond it. Moved totally beyond it. We had to evolve and adapt, and that was not comfortable. Certainly was not comfortable. But I can tell you the outcome, the outcome has been we're much more, um, I, I don't want to, maybe isolated is a good word. We're more isolated to our expertise than we are at a broad stroke of the brush as a financial advisor. So now we're sought after for these, these specialty things that we function in instead of the whole breath, you know, brush stroke. Does that make sense? Therefore, I'm able to demand a higher pay rate per hour or per case than I would be with the broader brush stroke. Now, I don't have as much quantity, but I certainly have not let down on the quality, and I certainly have demanded a higher price point for that expertise. Amen? Proverbs 21.20, look at this. There is precious treasure and oil, circle that. I believe God's speaking to us prophetically through this right here. There is precious treasure and oil in the dwelling of the wise, but the foolish man swallows it up. The first part of the verse is their focal point. There's precious treasure and oil in the dwelling of the wise. See, it's not enough to be anointed. God also wants you to be prospering. It's not enough to have anointing dripping off of your life and lifestyle. It's not. Because you can be anointed and broke. I've seen this for years. I've known very anointed men and women of God absolutely broke. They couldn't even pay attention if they had to. They couldn't leave town if they had to. It's not enough to be anointed. God wants you to be oiled up with His presence and His power, but also have treasure in your house so you can accomplish the vision He puts in your heart. That's how it works. Do not be schooled by the many voices in media that talk about prosperity in a derogatory sense. Because for them to even get their little message out, they spend millions every week, honey. And contributors give to them. Do you hear me? That's kind of like the zebra laughing at the horse because he doesn't have stripes. 
Does that make sense? Moving on. So with this treasure and oil, if we're a person of wisdom, we will have substance, we will have assets, we'll have uh, uh, components of increase and prosperity in our life, and simultaneously be anointed of God to accomplish what's in our heart. Now, whether that's ministry or whether that's commerce, whether, whatever that be, God will anoint you in it. Amen? Now, I've also seen this. Somebody comes in the church, they start prospering, and all of a sudden the pastor wants to make them the next preacher. Sometimes that's the worst thing we could do for that individual. Or a celebrity gets saved, gets filled with the Holy Spirit, and now all of a sudden they want to make them a preacher. Sometimes that's the worst thing that can happen. You just took the light out of the dark place that needs it and brought it where all there, you know, there's a bunch of flashlights. Does it make us all feel good? How, that's double dumb to me. How will we ever influence other segments of society if we always take the light God brings up in that area and bring it into the house where we're all burnt, beaming with light anyway? Doesn't mean they can't come to church. But sometimes they fail miserably because they're trying to be a minister instead of being a believer. Does that make sense? I can give you example after example after example. Well-known celebrities started Bible studies, started trying to be pastors or preachers, and they fell at it miserably. Get into false doctrine and fallacy, and guess what? They become not a light, but a detriment to the body of Christ. I can. All because of wrong information. So that's what we teach here. Let us live and thrive where God's planted us. Does that make sense? Because where God plants us is where He always had, has already assigned provision. In that sphere of influence you already have, He's going to have you ruling and reigning in. Because it's a place that He's given to you of influence. Does that make sense? Now to some people that sounds like, oh, you're trying to cope the pulpit. No, I'm not. Trust me. I'd like to give the pulpit away about every other week. Okay? <laughs> I really do. I love to receive. I love it whenever I get to hear Diana teach. Josh, well, not too bad. Yeah, I guess so. No, I, I do. I love it when, when our team all get to teach. I love I would do it more, but I don't want to burden you guys. So if you ever have some, just say, Pastor, I, I, I really want to teach. And I, I mean, we'll make it work, right? Um, and I'm so thankful when I do get to go away on vacation or whatever, you guys are very well and hold down. The, it's great. It's awesome. But watch this. The point I'm trying to make is sometimes God is trying to get us to flourish right in the sphere He planted us in. Amen? That's where provision will be. That's where peace will be. That's where um, uh, we'll be sustained. And let us not pluck that up just because somebody says, we need to fit a different pattern or mold. Amen? James 1.5 If you lack wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously, look at this, to all without finding fault. God doesn't come to give wisdom and then pick out all your splinters in the process. No. He comes and gives you wisdom without finding fault. And then what does he say? And it will be given to you. God is not the fault finder. Man is. God is the giver of wisdom. Amen?